you know, it's great to talk about ROI and the hard numbers, but there's a lot of like, what are we trying to do here at the end of the day? Um, you know, we're trying to improve people's lives. We're trying to increase freedom and being able to show people, you know, what your donation is actually going to accomplish is a really critical factor in being able to raise money. Hey there, this is Patrick with Antidote. Today we're having a conversation about partnering with consultants and agency to raise more money. I'm joined by Tim Bertram, partner and co-founder at Optimize Consulting. How are you doing today, Tim? Hey, how's it going? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, it's, you know, it's a good day today and uh, I'm happy to be able to talk to you. Can you tell me like a little bit more um, about what Optimize Consulting, you know, what you guys do, who you serve, you know, kind of just a little bit about you and your background. Yeah, sure. Um, so Optimize Consulting, uh, we got started in 2018 as a as a side gig <laughs> and then uh, learned that I could do it full time. So we basically service pro-liberty organizations and candidates. So that, that's prospecting emails, that's house file emails, uh, it's Facebook advertising, um, it's also CRM management and, and automations. Um, and on the nonprofit side, we also help kind of upgrade donors as well. Yeah. And you mentioned that Optimize, like it started as kind of a side project sort of thing. How did you and your co-founders find each other? And, and how did, you know, what, what has kind of been the building process for you? We worked in uh, different digital market agencies before, and we just kind of collectively came together and realized that we can drive a lot more value than I think a lot of the other agencies can do. You know, I think one, you see where the partners aren't necessarily involved in the day to day. So we like to drive value there. And we're also just, you know, we try to really identify what the core things our clients want. They, they want new leads. They want to upgrade someone from being a hundred dollar donor to a thousand to 5,000 to 10, um, whatever that may be. So that's kind of how it all came to be is that we had worked at previous agencies before and figured that we can really help drive more value for people with what they really at, the, at their core want. You know, some people really engage in the like, oh, look how many Facebook likes and reactions I can get you on this social post. Whereas, you know, we're a fundraising agency, so you can look at our report at the end of the day and know, okay, are, are these guys actually raising me money? And uh, we know the tools that we work with, such as Antidote or HubSpot, um, are fundraising in ethical ways. That's really important to us, too. Um, so that's why we decided to, you know, create Optimized Consulting is that we found that we can probably drive more value than others can and do it in an ethical way. Gotcha. And kind of what is your role in the company and, and how do you interface uh, with your clients on a regular basis? Sure. Yeah. I think that's one thing that we do pretty well is that, you know, I think sometimes people hire an agency and they, they worry that, okay, I hear from the president or the co-founder during the, the business pitch and then the dude disappears <laughs> immediately after. So I'm actually pretty involved in, in the, the overarching strategy on the account. So we do like to be a little more involved than I, I think the most people do. We really care about how we take that $100 donor and convert them to being a consistent supporter of any organization or candidate. So um, we mostly interface on that on the day to day. Do, do you also interface with like their traditional fundraisers as well? Or, or what does that relationship look like, you know, um, both with what you do and then maybe what some other vendors do? Sure. Yeah. So we, we do. So a lot of like the direct mail partners or the events or a lot of the, the major gift officers. So we really try to merge those departments. Um, while I do digital marketing, I'm not anti direct mail or anything like that. The beauty of digital is you get a multi channels, right? You get the phone number, the email, the address, which is awesome. But again, we're really concerned with if we can take that small donation and make it a bigger gift, you know, convert someone from being a, a you know, a three digit to a four figure to a five figure giver. Um, that's really important. And that does incorporate mail in person, you know, visiting the person, phone calls, all that. So um, we work with the major gift officers and direct mail folks to, to get that done. Gotcha. And what would you say is like a good example of a success story? You don't necessarily need to mention the organization, but just kind of, do you have like an idea that comes to mind of like a really good success story that you've had? Yeah, I wish I could name names, but I have to respect our NDAs. But of course, of course. Um, yeah, so we, we've had a few clients where we've 5X their donor base. Um, within a year's time. So um, what we have found with, with online prospecting is that some nonprofits, they've primarily used mail as their method of prospecting. So they're used to a new donor acquisition costing upward, you know, 100, 150, even $200. Whereas we can get it down to, we've had it as low as 10, but typically what we can get nonprofits down to is a cost of $24 a donor. 
um, which is awesome when you're looking at, you know, a hundred dollars or more. But so I'm really proud of the, you know, the five Xing donor bases. That's always really nice to go into a, a new business pitch with uh, showing like how much return we can get people. But, but ultimately what I'm, what I'm most happy with is being able to take those, the, that, you know, that person that gives a hundred dollars, you know, we, do some automations where we're, you know, well screening them. We say, oh, this person has some real capacity. Um, we should actually try to meet with this donor and getting them to give a $20,000 gift or a $100,000 gift. Being able to talk through that and like getting that client, that ROI, that's going to, you know, pay for our services for years to come. Um, that's what really, that's what I'm really after on the day to day. Yeah. And when you're looking at a potential client, you know, I'm sure both there's good vendors, and bad vendors, but there's also good clients and bad clients. Sure. When you're looking for a good client, what do you look for when you're thinking about working with someone? We want clients who are willing to transform and are willing to grow. Um, so a lot of digital marketing and digital prospecting, it's not something that necessarily pays for itself month one, right? Um, it is an investment that nonprofits really have to consider and, and give time and effort. Um, so one, we want people that are looking to put time, to put effort, and to put money into to actually invest and make it profitable, um, but are willing to use a new technology that they haven't before. They're willing to upgrade that donation page that they haven't touched since 10 years ago, right? Um, that uh, doesn't work you know, when you click on Chrome or something like that. So we want people that are willing to embrace tools and, and different ideas to, to grow. Are you typically on like a mixed model of like a monthly retainer with someone or, or do you have, you know, sometimes, you know, what, what's kind of your model in terms of if somebody was going to pay you, what kind of pushback do you get? You know, so, so kind of yeah. how do you base your pricing along with making sure, you know, a 501c or 501c4 says, hey, I like you to do something differently. Um, you know, how do you approach them when it comes to that kind of stuff with pricing? We really try to show people our ROI through our arrangements too. So one, we like to do month to month um, just because I've, we found that a lot of nonprofits, especially C4, C3s, they, they hire a digital marketing agency, they have them on super high retainer and they, you know, cross their fingers, pray that it works out, right? <laughs> then, uh, you know, then you know, 10 months down the road, it hasn't and they're stuck in this agreement that they can't get out of. So we try to blend it where we're doing kind of a retainer and commission. That way our, our goals are aligned and that, you know, like if we're raising you more, you're paying us more. Um, but everyone's happy because, you know, we're bringing in more dollars, we're bringing in more prospects. So that's what we really try to do because we don't want people to get stuck into something where, oh, you know what, ultimately, you know, it's something didn't work out. Or we want you to be happy because, uh, wow, these guys are bringing us in so much more donors and so much more funds that um, we're really happy with this arrangement. So I think the blended model is really the way to go for both the client and the agency perspective. When you are raising money for nonprofits, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges um, that you face on just a day-to-day -day basis? I think a lot of donor officers kind of get in their minds of when they're speaking with their major givers and you have to figure out how that's going to convert to a new donor that's never once heard about you. You know, if I send you an email or a letter or give you a call and you've never heard about the organization before, you've got to find a way to, you know, quickly pull them in and then kind of give them a little more detail as to who you are, what you do. So really nailing down that message is probably like the, the biggest challenge people have on their prospecting efforts. And then also just on the, the conversion side too, of like being willing to ask, you know, there's this great guy. Um, he has this, uh, uh, what the quotes, uh, ask and you shall receive. His name is Jesus, um, right about everything. And I'm really convinced that donor officers, sometimes there's a fear of asking and being willing to put yourself out there. Um, so we really try to you know, help lead that effort and say, no, we, we are going to ask for funds. Um, we're we're going to ask in an appropriate way. Um, we're going to ask from people's support levels, what we know about them, to make that first time gift, to make that second gift, uh, or to make that larger, sizable contribution too. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. And I, I like that you talk so much about ROI. You know, you talk about the approach that how you guys are a little bit different. Um, and some of that may have been from past experiences, um, you know, maybe not ones you've worked with, but other companies, you know, you've heard of. Um, are there any examples you have of sort of like horror stories from clients who worked with somebody else, maybe didn't have the best experience, you know, obviously without naming names or just like some examples of that, because I think it yeah. might be helpful for organizations to understand because they might say, great, Tim, I love what you're saying. 
you know, but as I'm evaluating people, what can I do to sort of protect myself? Yeah, I would say the biggest thing, um, we've encountered this a few times recently, is you as the client, you need to own all of your assets. Um, you need to be in charge of any one of your accounts, your Facebook business manager, your Facebook ads account. Um, you need to own your email list. Um, and you need to specifically call out that, hey, no, the vendor does not get to rent out or, or whatever my list because you don't want it to be where, you know, maybe you change your mind about that agency or, you know, two years later or you're not going to seek re-election or something changes and then you're stuck with an email list that you don't own and can't use or a business manager account you can't ever access. So owning your assets and having transparency into those contracts, I think is probably the biggest warning I'd give out to any any client that's looking to work with an agency. Yeah. And I've, I've seen that too, as well. Like sometimes, you know, I'll see the contracts where, you know, like you said, read the contracts, <laughs> make right. sure you understand what you're signing yourself up for, um, whether that be, you know, moving over somewhere else, who has ownership and, and also who can share it too, right? You know, one thing that we do at Antidote that we're very strict on is we don't have any, you know, data sharing or we have very strict, you know, sort of things on data privacy and there's different models, right? There's some companies where you have the right to share a certain amount of data and, and you do that for a reduced rate. But to your point, it's very important to understand who owns what, who has access to what um, and what that looks like contractually in case, you know, the, the relationship doesn't go well or, or you decide to go in a different direction. Right. I mean, just, you know, frankly put, you know, consultants can be vultures. They're looking to make the quickest buck they can. Um, and you need to be able to protect yourself against that. And, you know, if, if you're especially if you're a kind of a legacy C3 or C4 and you have donors that are giving, you know, sizable contributions, you don't want some vendor giving away or you know, calling up a donor that gives a hundred thousand dollars to your organization annually. Um, so you really do need to be protective of it. Yeah. And, and kind of tied to that, um, just a follow up question on data sharing is, is there, are there standard practices with data sharing that people should watch out for? Because I, I would think every agency might have a different approach to kind of data sharing. They do. So that's something that's worth calling out as well, because you don't want it to be where you are under the impression that you own all of your data and then the agency that you hired is renting your list out to every single candidate running for, you know, dog catcher in America, right? Um, and that does happen. So you need to just make absolutely crystal clear who owns the data. And if there are permissions to use the data that the agency has, what do those permissions look like? Under what terms can they rent a list? Um, but I personally don't really believe that agencies should have ownership of the data. I think you create that for them and that's an asset that they get to own forever. But just make sure that you've made an arrangement with your agency um, to determine who owns the data. So, so what's really interesting is that even though you're a consulting company and we're a technology company, I feel like there's a lot of overlap in that everything that we do is about relationships uh, and working with people. So, so what are some of the ways that, that you optimize relationships and, and bring in that sort of heart, right, and, and really connect um, with some of the potential donors for the organizations that you work with? Yeah, sure. So my dad's actually a, a pastor uh, back in Minnesota. So I've kind of grown up with not exactly a fundraising education, but, you know, as a pastor, he was concerned about, you know, raising dollars for the church. And you really have to connect it to not just, you know, it's great to talk about ROI and the hard numbers, but there's a lot of like, what are we trying to do here at the end of the day? Um, you know, we're trying to improve people's lives. We're trying to increase freedom and being able to show people, you know, what your donation is actually going to accomplish is a really critical factor in being able to raise money. So we, we kind of have a, a a science and an art job where uh, we bring the tactics that we know are going to work, but we also have to have that art where we're telling people like how they're going to accomplish so-and-so job. And you really do have to connect those two at the end of the day. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and that's, that's a good reason why they'd want a professional like you, right? Is to make sure that they're connecting those dots, both on the science side, best practices, and also making sure that somebody's brand is really shown through with what they're doing. Is there any other piece of advice that you would give to organizations if they're thinking about hiring a company like yours or, or anything that you think they should be thinking about as, as they're looking at doing something like that? Yeah, you know, I think you should just have radical transparency with people with, with pricing. Um, you know, I've seen some nightmare situations where someone will charge a, you know, a 20 or 30 percent markup on ad spend or on a list rental. Um, that's something you just need to be aware of. 
That makes sense. I mean, bottom line is protect yourself, know what's going on. If somebody wants to reach out to you, what is the best way to connect with you? If they're like, Tim, I love what you said. I want to potentially work with your sure. company. You know, what's the best way to connect with you? Sure. Yeah. I mean, probably just my email. It's Tim at optimized consulting LLC.com. So um, that's probably the best way to reach me or my phone number 651-356-2455. Perfect. Yeah. So this was Tim with Optimize Consulting. Um, thanks for being here with us today and sharing your insights on how to partner with agencies. Cool. Thanks, Patrick. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Learn From The Pros. If you got something out of this video, be sure to leave a comment below with your biggest takeaway. Also, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more videos like these. I'm Patrick with Antidote, and we'll see you on the next one.